I think it's a good idea to keep a, a, a nice looking cup of. I know. It's like, look at this very expensive glass I'm holding. I know. You just make me feel bad about this, my water bottle, which goes everywhere with me. Oh, no. So the reason I have that glass is because my relatives wanted to give me a nice gift, I think, for graduating, and they didn't know what I want. And they gave me Macy's gift card. I'm like, what do I do with this? I bought very nice glass. <laughs> uh, you have nice relatives. And yes, I do. I do. <laughs> yeah. So let's... Uh, uh, Let's get, I'm going to get us started because uh, many people would be listening to a recording. So mm -hmm. let me just, you know, some of them listen to it on podcast and where they won't be able to see us. So for them, let me say the introduction. Sure. Which is, you're listening to Empowered Women series. And this is where we have conversation with accomplished women like Dr. Ritu Raman, so that women's experiences and conversations become mainstream. And today we are going to talk about why do we need more women in STEAM? Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> I hope they're ready. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Uh, so uh, obviously, you know, this is something that I have promised myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that in the past I used to always call you Ritu. But this is something I have promised myself that if it is Dr. Raman, I am going to publicly always address you, Dr. Raman. Ooh, well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> it it's still, um, you know, when I first got my PhD, I was like really excited about it. And I thought it would wear off, but it still feels really nice. Like whenever somebody does it, I'm like, yes, that is me. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I appreciate that, though. Thank you. Yes. It's a, it's your crown. You are a queen, and it's your <laughs> crown, and you should wear it. And people should know that. People should know that. You know, even even when we cannot see that crown, it does exist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, know. yeah, I think especially I don't mind too much when it's like people outside of science um, don't necessarily say it because I'm like, oh well, maybe they don't know that it's like the norm to to call people with PhDs doctor, um, but. The, yesterday I got an email from somebody who was like very much in academia and actually like one step junior to me um and they called me miss and I was like what like <laughs> and they signed their email doctor and I was like um excuse me <laughs> like, like you should 100% know better and especially if you're gonna refer to yourself as doctor it's a little weird to call me miss so of course I told my parents about it and my my mom and dad were like so salty because they're so proud and they're like how dare you? they were like don't even email him back <laughs> I was like okay mom <laughs> it was very funny and and which is which is why which is why you know I have promised myself uh uh, because, you know, people do find it extremely easy or they don't think that they should address women with their right way of addressing. Mm -hmm. They just feel it's okay to, you know, either call them by first. It's like just the second level of sweetheart, sweetie. And uh, like, yeah, we have come a long way to call us by our first names. But there is, you know, and if I if we don't educate and make it, make people aware of it no one else will mm -hmm. and you know one thing i've noticed is that um at least a couple years ago i think sometimes people are getting a little more aware of this issue but when i was first starting out like right after my phd and you know i had doctor and some things like my twitter handle and stuff um some of the guys that i um like my peers who are men in, in science would be like oh, like kind of making fun of me or saying that was kind of uppity or being like, well, I don't really care if people call me doctor. And I'm like, well, you know, you don't care because generally people assume that you're the expert when you walk into a room rather than assuming that you're like the student that's just like so happy or lucky to be there. And so I'm like, if people assumed my expertise and respected me as soon as I walked into the room, maybe I wouldn't care. But sometimes I feel like they don't. And so I need to remind them that I actually know what I'm talking about. So yeah, yeah it's one of those things where maybe the need for it will go away. But I think then the respect has to be implicit. And it's just, we're not right there right now as women. 
Yes, yeah. And and I am completely with you. And I have heard different versions of your story in different professions from different women. Mm-hmm. And, okay. uh, and we need to work on it. Uh, and we need to help. You know, if they cannot do it on their own, we need to help them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so let's, you know, first of all, uh, just to get us started, uh, it is, I always find it difficult to introduce you because you have, it's like, you have a definition of multifaceted. You are, you know, when I think of you, first thing that comes to my mind is engineer, scientist, writer, educator, then founder of Wisdom at MIT, then uh, ambassador for If Then, and uh, I I don't know, it's, and uh, and obviously, a current postdoctoral fellow at MIT. Is there anything that I forgot? No, I think those are those sound like all of the things. Eater of ice cream, maybe. I feel like that's something that I take very seriously as a job. It's in my Instagram bio, so I clearly value that very highly. But I think yes, that is most of the things outside of the ice cream realm that I would consider part of my identity. Yeah, it is. Uh, ice cream is very important one. Right. I, yeah. Thank you. I am not a professional ice cream eater, but I always like to take people's point of views on uh, mm-hmm. one is which ice cream do you like the best? Is it the flavor or is it the brand? Oh, oh, I never even thought about it that way. <laughs> um, mine is very seasonal. I've realized that like, you know, when it's um, a little bit like fall or wintry outside, I'm like, you know, like coffee chocolate chip or uh, chocolate chip cookie dough, your classics. But in the summer, I'm a hardcore like sorbet fan. There's a lot of like lemon gelato in my freezer right now because I have decided it's summer. So just putting that energy out into the world. Okay, so I'm going to take us with that. Uh, I'm going to have this uh, ice cream conversation in detail with you someday. Okay, (laughs) but back to science. (laughs) Hey, I, I, you cannot take ice cream not seriously. It yeah. is a serious matter, but mm-hmm. we want to talk about uh, yeah, something even more important, which is women in STEM. And uh, it is a topic very close to my heart. Although, you know, I am not in a STEM field. I, as a, uh, I did leave a STEM career. I did mm-hmm. leave a STEM I can't say leave. Going for an going to an engineering college for a one month is not called a career, but mm-hmm. I tried to pursue it at some time, at some point, and uh, gave it up. So I am for that, and for many other reasons that we will talk about. I'm extremely. I feel close to it, and I do feel that women should opt for a STEM career. So, first question. First question is what the main, you know, the elephant in the room. Why do you think we need more women in STEM? Um, I mean, I think for me, it's it's really just about having more people in STEM. <laughs> um, and, you know, part of that is because I think we have so many problems in the world um, that are so difficult. You know, I think something like there's going to be 10 billion people living on the planet by 2050. And we need energy and food and water for and healthcare for all of those people. And that kind of stresses me out a little bit because, you know, it seems like there's all these huge challenges to, to fix. And the only thing that calms me down when I start stressing about that is being like looking at all the scientists around me and, and seeing them, um, you know, use scientific innovation to solve some of the problems they see. But then when I see there aren't that many scientists or like people aren't trusting in scientists or there aren't that many scientists who are women or people of color. Um, It freaks me out for two reasons. One being there's just not enough people. That means, right? Like there's people that are probably interested that you are keeping out of this field. And that means we're pushing away the time at which we can have food and water and and healthcare for everybody. Um, But then beyond that, you know, there's also the whole concept of, more creative ideas and solutions come from more diverse groups. So what if we're not even 
pushing back the timeline, but completely cutting out potential solutions that could happen if people with more diverse backgrounds and interests came into the room when they were deciding what science challenges to solve and how to solve them. So that's, I would say, why um, I think there should be more women in science. And, and it's, a, it's a sort of thing where I think a lot of people can get behind it, right? Where if you care about women's rights and equality and feminism, then you can be like, yeah, like more women in science. That's great. I want to do that. But also, even if you completely did not care, right? And you were like, it yeah, really doesn't matter. But I guarantee that you probably care about living in a safe and healthy world in 30 years, um, or you want a safe and healthy world for your kids. So even if you just wanted to be super selfish, focus not selfish, but like, if you just wanted to focus on yourself and not necessarily some broader social justice movement, that's totally fine. I think you can still get behind the message of why there should be more people in science solving these problems. And I remember you mentioning in our previous, one of our previous conversations that, and the diverse point of view is mm -hmm. important in solving problems. Do you want to say a little more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a sort of thing where um, people don't even think to ask certain types of questions when they don't have that experience, right? So one thing that comes to mind is there have been a lot of articles lately on pulse oximeters, these devices that are being used to measure oxygen saturation in people's blood, um, don't work as well on people with darker skin. Um, and that's because, you know, the light is not penetrating as deeply and as a high intensity through skin that's darker. It just has trouble. That's physics. Like that's how that works. And this has been a problem for so long and it's thing issues for people. And it's one of those things where you have to wonder if there were people with darker skin in that room, is it not something or people who knew somebody with darker skin or had some experiences related to that, it would, it would probably have come up because we experience stuff like this all the time. You know, there are issues of um, black people and brown people not being able to turn on the automatic um, sinks right in bathrooms because our skin's too dark and it's not activating it. so like you would have had that experience you would have had the experience of buying sunscreen and realizing that it doesn't blend into your face you would have had all of these other things to inform your worldview of like your skin is actually a really important and different barrier and maybe if that person had been in that room they would have built a better pulse oximeter and we wouldn't have this issue right now so that's just one example um not necessarily focused on women, but I think there are plenty of examples like that where, um, you know, different backgrounds and experiences are clearly valid um, and you have to have them as part of the conversation when you're solving problems that affect billions of people. Yeah. Thank you so much. So there were like so many answers within that answer. It's like, don't you, you don't need to care about social justice movement. It's not about gender equality. You know, it's about... <laughs> It's it's about having a better world for yourself and for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In and which you know which brings me to like if it is so obvious if it is so obvious that you know that there should be more women in and by the way if you are listening to us this is for you if you are listening to us and you have something to share on anything that Dr. Raman is saying or I am asking please add your thoughts. Like, you know, if you feel like answering why there should be more, more women in STEM, please put your thoughts in uh, in comments and uh, both of us will. And of course, if you have any questions for Dr. Raman, please ask. She is uh, incredibly smart and I usually think she has all the answers. And if she doesn't, mm -hmm. we will surely have answers after she eats ice cream. Yes, 100%. <laughs> yeah. So, it you know, from what, you know, because I... This is another one of your superpowers that you you put complicated stuff in really simple language and you make it like, duh, why didn't anyone think about this? So <laughs> I'm feeling the same thing, which is, oh, it seems so obvious. Then why didn't anyone think about this? And why aren't there already more women in uh, pursuing STEM career? Or, you know, why don't we see more scientists around us, more engineers, more doctors, more anything mm -hmm. related to science more around us? Why is that so? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I think that um, 
you know, there's, I think there's different schools of thought on this. And you could always say, well, there's explicit bias um, against women in STEM or women pursuing these careers. Um, I think that's partially true, um, but I don't think it's the complete story. And I think the reason that that narrative doesn't always um, sit right with people is that one, a lot of people are not explicitly biased, um, but also a, people who are explicitly biased are very careful not to do it in front of other people. So like when they tell you, you can't do something because you're a woman or like you only won that thing because you're a woman, they are very careful not to do it in front of other people so that you look like the crazy person for being like, do, 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 does nobody see that the thing that just happened? Um, so that's part of it is that explicit bias, it's like, it's not that it's not common, but it, it's usually hidden. Um, the bigger part is that most of the bias that we face is implicit. It's from people who are probably well-meaning, um, who aren't thinking about the unconscious messages that they're sending, um, who aren't thinking about what they promote a young girl when she says she likes two things like which thing are they choosing to highlight what, what thing are they saying like oh you're really pretty or oh you're really smart you know like those kinds of things where so much of us um grow up in this environment and it's not unique to men it's not like only men have implicit bias against women women also have implicit bias against women it's part of the culture um so i think that's what makes it so hard is that there's very few cases where you can like point out and be like, look at this really mean thing that this person said in front of everybody else um, to women. Most of the time it's either hidden or it's implicit. And, and those kinds of things are really hard to fight against. Um, and I think that that's part of the reason why um, sort of the, the underrepresentation happens and, and persists. It's, it's a really insidious beast. It is very hard to fight. Yes. And I, uh, I obviously, you know, because I have seen this in a few other industries also, and then I have also been told it's all in your head. Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, you know, that person didn't really mean that, but because I have seen it so many times, I know that it's not in my head. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> I that all the time. And uh, I, I want to ask your opinion on, on, on something. I have observed that uh, traditionally the I I have been seeing this trend in a lot of other professions also like finance or STEM or uh, you know related to that medicine mm -hmm. the, the the high paying jobs have become male dominated and the low paying jobs have become female dominated so uh, nurses, teachers, mm. really, you know, extremely high amount of work and lower pay jobs have become women's. So do you think, is there something in STEM careers, which is because it is, uh, because it is high paying, women have been intentionally kept out? W what's your opinion on that? I'm not asking for an analysis, but opinion. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. But in, and I almost want to think about it. There's like two ways, right? We could think about it as there's careers um, that are intrinsically high paid and, and those are the ones that are keeping women out at higher rates. Um, it could also be that there are careers where women have historically found it easier to merge into, you know, start their careers in or, you know, felt more accepted like nursing or teaching or things where people felt it was more similar to the nurturing role of, of the mother in the home. And because there were so many women there is why we undervalue <laughs> those jobs and why we think that that's not worth as much money as other people, right? So, I mean, it's a sort of thing where you know, you could think about it in the context of professional chefs. I've always thought about this, like why when we look at like professional chefs or bakers, at least when I was younger and growing up, like they're predominantly men. And like most of the people that you think about cooking in your life, in your home, in your friends' homes are women because it's the moms. And I'm like, oh, so when it's done for free and done well, like then it's the woman. But once you start paying for it, then like men <laughs> get another thing. And so I, I think that there's probably like a back and forth like it's not just that it's an it's a well-paid profession and there aren't that many women i think there's also things where it's a great profession there ended up being a bunch of women in it and because of that we were just like 
meh, women's work, like doesn't, shouldn't be paid that well. Um, so I think that's part of it. But I think even in STEM, you know, going back, so pretending there's no feedback. Um, one thing that I see a lot even in STEM is how many people like with PhDs, for example, um, how often are women pushed towards some of the higher earning track or um, pa purchasing power kind of roles in terms of like entrepreneurship, venture capital, um, you know, business development. There are all these things where I'm like, oh, these people are actually making a lot of money. And I was never encouraged to pursue any of those things, even though like we were in the same programs and working on the same degrees and I'm doing something that's very marketable. And it's the thing where that's where I start questioning, like, huh, it is odd that I never got any encouragement from anyone to pursue anything outside of academia, which I love and is super interesting. And there's also not a lot of women professors out there, but it's interesting that I was even more discouraged from pursuing some of the higher compensated career paths um, that would have been open to me with a PhD. So I think it's a little bit of both. Long answer. Yeah, I, 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 I love that long answer because you don't leave any uh, stone unturned. When I ask you a question, you go through everything that is related to the topic and tell me about everything. And always love that. So we have one question from Zach. He's asking about, which is related to my next question. Uh, he's asking you about uh, what efforts or campaigns have you seen so far, which have been effective at encouraging women into STEM? That's a great question. Um, and I think it's the sort of thing... Um, that is very dependent on the stage of the career. I think the best efforts or campaigns that I've seen are all very focused on like, what is, it's not just women in STEM, but it's like women, this discipline at this stage in their career. And like, what is the thing that they need to be supported and promoted as they go into the next stage of their career? For example, um, you mentioned, I think that I, uh, you know, I'm an if then ambassador with AAAS, which is they have like 125 women around the country and they've created a bunch of like photos and videos and stories of us sharing our science. And there's lots of different kinds of scientists. There's biomedical engineers like me, there's people who go to space, the people that study lizards. Um, it's all over the place. So that is focused very much on middle school aged girls. So like they know their target market and they're like, hey, here is content that girls of this age will identify with and let's give them, you know, in the places that they're looking. So Instagram stories or TikTok or, or whatever the kids are doing these days, like let's put that content there so that they are really engaged with it and also see a broad diversity of women, not only in terms of like appearance and personality, but the kinds of science they're pursuing. And, you know, that content has been per looked at by thousands and thousands of girls. I forget what the number is at this point. Um, and it's only been around for about a year. And we have like millions of views on these pictures and videos. So I, I think like that's an example of something where they've designed a campaign that is specific to that target market. Now, is something like that going to be equally useful for a woman who already has her PhD and is trying to be a professor? No, because like, there's no point in telling her, I mean, she might be interested in being like, oh, there's this great person that studies bats. That's great. But I actually work on like solar energy. So this is not going to help me necessarily become a member of the professoriate. So there, we're looking at things like the wisdom database that I started at MIT, which is, um, and, you know, highlighting women as potential speakers, uh, potential collaborators for research things, potential board seat members on startups. So it's very much focused on building up the CV, the speaking um, career, uh, and, and all those kind of things that help you build up your CV as you're building toward your professor job. So I think that's, um, you know, how I would think about effective campaigns is, is it developing content that is relevant to the audience that it's serving? Yeah, thank you for that. And, and which brings me to, the, to a question, which is, uh, so if you, there are a lot of things happening at a lot of different levels, right? And uh, and if we were to create highest impact, what would you think are the top three things that would work well for getting more women in STEM? Top 
three. Okay, um, this is a great question. So I think, um, well, okay, I guess the way I would think about it is this, um, you know, obviously starting young is good. And I think we should keep doing that. Um, I think that's how you get, it's not about getting girls interested in science. It's girls are already interested in science. Most people will like look at a rainbow and be like, oh, that's cool. I wonder how that happened, right? Like you're interested in science. The question is just not shutting that down when that curiosity and excitement pops. So I think that is something that we should always keep going is just when people are young, because we learn so many important lessons when we're young about our self-worth and what we're allowed to do and what's makes us a good girl or like a not good girl, that I think it's very important when you're young to teach people the confidence and you know the enthusiasm about science. Um, the second part is to focus on like, the later stage career, you know, women, because it doesn't matter if you encourage 100% of girls to do this, if they never see any role models ahead of them, um, it's very discouraging. And and I think, you know, we can't be like, oh, if we encourage a bunch of five-year-olds now, then in 50 years, this problem will be solved. Because we probably thought that 50 years ago, and it clearly isn't. So if you only focus your efforts on younger people and not on you know, some of the more subtle things of like, you know, where I am at my stage of my career, where a lot of things are related to who gets nominated or who is referred to as an expert in the field. Um, you know, those kinds of things that are a little less quantitative and a little more based on somebody's reputation and where implicit bias can really have an impact. That's a place to intervene and think about how do we build up these um, women who are already launching their careers or later stage and, and keep them in there so that when those five year olds catch up, they're like, oh, yeah, she's great. I want to keep doing this. So I end up like her. Um, and I would say the third area um, is maybe the place that is least invested in, in time and money right now, um, which are efforts focused at, on 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 boys and, and young men uh, and teaching them to view women as experts and leaders. You know, one example that I have is that I used to teach at the summer camp for girls. And uh, it was great. It was wonderful. We interacted with all these girls. But what happened, what often happened is that the summer camp counselors all the women would go to the girls' summer camp, and then the co-ed summer camp would end up being predominantly boys, and all of the people who were, um, you know, counselors for that would end up being men. And so you just split up people, so these these boys don't really see me as like, oh, there's a woman with a PhD who knows more about science than I do. I can learn from her. Um, so if they're not learning that women can be experts in science, then how are they going to act when they go into a college classroom or they see a woman who's a professor or a woman who's a couple years ahead of them and maybe uh, a TA? You know, if we neglect that, then I think we're doing a big disservice to the community as a whole. So I would say that's where the the third prong should be. Not not enough people do that. Yeah. I actually want, I want to talk about the third prong, mm -hmm. which is, it's not just in STEM. It's, it's, I think one is, you know, I let's, let's agree on something that we already agree on, which is, it's not just about, you know, gender equality is not about gender equality. It's about making this world way, way better by, having diversity of every kind and equality of every kind. And so similar thing, what you have seen at uh, that, you know, there is at summer camp level also exists in business school level, also mm -hmm. exists and at professional level. Women's conferences will have women speakers and we'll talk about gender equality only with women. Mm -hmm. Wherein it's, like women know that they should be most, well, most women know that there should be gender equality and yeah. men know about it, it's not going to actually work. Mm -hmm. And which is why those co-ed camps need to also become, it just needs to be one camp yeah. talking about everything and women speakers in equal amount or even more women speakers so that they see it and they get used to seeing women in leadership positions or mm -hmm. so i just wanted to put it out there you talked about summer camp i am saying that you know obviously you're aware of it it just exists at every every level going back yeah. to your previous answer that 
we cannot just work on five year olds. We have yeah. to work with every audience of every level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think and, the great thing about humans is that I think we're very adaptable, very plastic. And, um, I think most people are open and willing to learn and adapt, even as they're older. So <laughs> fingers crossed that those kinds of efforts at all levels will help. And it is, so, so that's, yeah, a, a perfect uh, leeway for my uh, another question, which is, oh when, is it too late? when is it too late? Because I can tell you, uh, uh, not about STEM career, but uh, I love cooking. And I always mm -hmm. wanted to be, uh, there was a time when I wanted to become a chef. Uh, and uh, I think only one person told me that uh, women are never chefs. Like it's not a woman's, uh, it's not a woman's job because it takes a lot of physical strength and you have to uh, pick up a lot of uh, huge things. That's why women can never become chefs. And also when I was young, there wasn't, there weren't too many chefs around. Mm -hmm. So I, just one person saying that, and it also talks about something, you know, like you don't need to encourage women because... Yeah encouragement already exists you have to not discourage them from doing things yeah so absolutely also the chef thing is just so ridiculous to me i'm like i bet your mom cooked all of your meals growing up like there are some people whose dads cook but like most people it's their moms and like come on ridiculous yeah. um but yeah okay so when is it too late is your question mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's a great question. And, you know, I don't want to be super simplistic and just be like, oh, it's never too late. Because there are situations where you can say, like for me right now, I'm 29. Um, if I decided I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, um, I would have to go to med school and do a residency and do a fellowship and maybe do a research year doing that. And at some point, I could say, like, is this really worth it? Like, there's a certain amount of time and skill set that it takes to do that particular skill or that particular surgery. Um, it's too late, but like, is it worth that time investment for me? And I don't want to be dismissive of that because a lot of these careers do take a certain amount of time and specialty and, and dedication. However, there are, you know, different kinds of, of STEM and, and different ways that you can incorporate into your career. And I think this will become actually even more and more important in the coming years as even for people who are trained in STEM, um, STEM goes out of fashion pretty quickly. Um, you're, there are people who are, my dad's a mechanical engineer and I'm a mechanical engineer. We have entirely different skill sets and he's not that much older than me, right? Like, I mean, he's my dad, but he had me when he wasn't like super old. So even within a few decades, um, the skill that a mechanical engineer needs became drastically different. So like he doesn't do mechanical engineering anymore. He does other things. He picked up new skills. Um, and that's a, that sort of lifelong learning needs to happen for all of us, whether we're trained in STEM or not. There are plenty of people who didn't train in technology or computer science that code, you know, make websites right now or work on apps or are, we're all digital natives. Um, all of those things are things we learned. So I think in that sense, you can certainly say that it's really never too late to tackle on aspects of STEM careers, you know, learning more about AI and how it impacts your career. Not that's like too buzzy of a word, but you know what I mean? Or like, you know, cultivating vaccine literacy and, and sharing that, um, understanding how those things work, um, understanding maybe how, you know, certain types of renewable energy work, using that to inform how you outfit your house and think about energy use in your own home. All of those ways, um, you can incorporate STEM literacy into your life and incorporate it both into your personal life and into your professional life. So that that's how I would think about it is that it's never too late to incorporate it in some form. I'm not going to be super dismissive and say you can be anything anytime whenever you want because <laughs> that's that's a very privileged thing to say because it assumes that you have a lot of money and time and health to do all of those <laughs> things. Um, but I don't think it's ever too late to learn a new skill no matter whether that's in STEM or not in STEM. And and that I completely stand by. Yeah. And you also, you know, you, uh, people do know that science and human are extremely closely related. Mm. And uh, yet science, science and human behavior is seen as two different things. And 
when you talked about vaccination, when you talked about uh, AI, you we are also talking about how how science relates to human being and how it is informed by humans. Mm-hmm. And for well, again, not to not to simplify your answer, but you might be too late to uh, get a PhD, maybe, but. I think that that relationship, because as you grow older, your understanding of humans and people is uh, slightly higher than younger people. Mm-hmm. And you can use that to help the science is yeah. obviously, this is not my, this is not my interview. This is your interview, but I just couldn't. No, that's, a great point. that's a great point actually, because it, it makes me think a little bit more about um, what I learn from my parents, for example, um, who often like to, you know, they're always like, let me tell you something. Let me drop some wisdom in. It's annoying how right they are often and how sometimes I don't see it. But, um, you know, when you talk about knowledge of human beings, um, I think there are times when I get very dismissive of people or get a little bit uppity, like, why don't you understand this? Like, you know, like on WhatsApp, you have these like Indian aunties and uncles sending you some meme about how like turmeric is going to cure COVID. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like, this is so dumb. Like, who are these people? This is so stupid. Why are we even, you know, I can, I get very frustrated, but I think my parents um, do a really good job of sort of mellowing me out and, and teaching me to be a little bit more like the fact that if you're a little bit more open and respectful and find a way to connect with that person and not come at them like, hi, I'm Dr. Raman from MIT. And I have to say, you know, nobody wants to listen to that person. And so as, as difficult as those lessons are sometimes for me to hear from my parents, um, I do learn a lot from them. And it is because of their longer life experience. <laughs> um, so I think that's a that's a really excellent point. There yeah. are things that you learn that are you know just as valuable and specifically with you know like we have a great example right now which is about vaccination like science did its job of inventing a vaccine but it is people who understand people and human behavior it is their job to make everybody take that vaccine yeah yeah and and not and not dismiss people's fears and concerns out of right just because just because you've spent 10, 20 years learning about this and you know that it's nothing to worry about doesn't mean that it's somebody else's job to be equally knowledgeable about that because they were busy being very knowledgeable about the thing that their job is. Um, So it doesn't mean they're stupid. It doesn't mean they're illiterate. It just means that they know about a bunch of stuff that you don't know. Um, But right now it's your responsibility to, to share and be respectful. Yeah. I'm so thankful to your parents. Like, you know, I uh, I obviously, you know, being around Boston, I have a lot of scientist friends. A lot mm-hmm. of, uh, uh, I think it's a, it's mandatory in Boston that you have. Yeah, uh, yeah it would be very people. uncool if you didn't. <laughs> yeah. And uh, although they are great people, uh, I, I have seen this, you know, this exceptional people skill of simplifying things and being able to relate to everyone and having a patient conversation about science with everyone. I have seen that in very few people. And I say it again and again, and I'm going to say it again. I see it in you. And today I'm going to give that credit to your parents. And I'm very thankful to them for, you know, uh, uh, annoying you every time to time. <laughs> Great. I'll have them watch this so they can be like, I'll be like, see, I value you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely, it definitely comes from them. Um, it definitely comes from learning not to value yourself too highly and, and treat other people with respect. Um, and it also comes from the fact that we moved around a lot growing up and I had to learn to communicate with a lot of very different kinds of people and realize that just because they don't speak the same language as you doesn't mean they're stupid. Um, And that language could literally be a different language or it could be a different disciplinary language like science. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. You being a a third culture child, Mm -hmm. having uh, grown up in multiple countries, obviously plays, you know, that's another category of a lot of my friends in I admire how you guys can quickly make friends with anyone and have a long conversation with anyone. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. I want the entire world to be like that. Uh, Me too. I I 
never, you know, when I was a kid and moving around a ton and I would kind of be like a little whiny about it or a little complainy. Um, but now that I'm older, I'm like, oh, that was, this is a very useful life skill. Like I can be friends with a person that I met in an elevator for 30 seconds and I will know their life history. Um, and it's fun. I like it. That's one of the things I, I like about myself a lot. So thank you. I do too. I like that about you a lot, among other things. <laughs> and just this is my last question for you. We are kind of approaching uh, end of our conversation. So if there was one thing, if there is one thing that each one of us could do after having this conversation so that there are we somehow we help getting more women in STEM, what would that be? What would that one thing be? Hmm. You know, going back to this idea of not, we don't need to encourage, we just need to prevent discouraging. Um, we can't, we can't necessarily completely stop that. We can't necessarily stop the negative messages that somebody is receiving from all those things. But I think what each of us could do if we really care about this topic is the next time we see somebody say something to a little girl that, you know, maybe she could interpret you know, is, is discouragement or say something to a little boy that makes him feel like maybe women aren't people that should be respected or, or viewed as experts. We don't necessarily need to shame or call out the person who's doing it. Um, but maybe we could talk to the person who received that message and and give them an alternate perspective or, or viewpoint, um, just to have a little bit of positivity. Because, you know, you mentioned giving up on this dream because somebody had said something quite mean and unkind and untrue to you about chefs. But if somebody else who was also a valid and respected adult had been like, actually think about the fact that like a lot of the great chefs you know in your life are women, or actually there's this great famous chef who is a woman um, who's doing all these great culinary innovations. Maybe you wouldn't have quit, right? Or maybe it would have at least served as this counterpoint in your head of like, oh, that person said this, but somebody else said something else. Um, I think that's something that we could all do. And again, I don't think it needs to be confrontational. I don't think you need to go up to somebody and be like, you sexist, I can't believe you said this. I'm just saying like, go to the person who got that message and see if you can boost them up a little bit and maybe give them an alternate perspective. Um, that could be really helpful. And I'm not just, I, I think that that's a validated theory because there were certainly people when I was young, um, I distinctly remember uh, an older, not not an uncle, but like an uncle in the Indian sense, like an older person who told me that there were no famous women in science and like no women in science had done anything good or important in STEM. And if he were the only voice that I heard, I would have believed him. But I already knew that my mom was a great chemical engineer. And I had other people in my life telling me about, you know, Marie Curie and Rosalind Franklin and all these great people. So that one voice was not the only thing I heard and it made an impact. Um, so try to be the voice that's sharing something positive instead. I, I cannot uh, I, I cannot tell you how important it is, how, you know, it's, uh, it's like in, in the, it's like the media, like negative news is always louder. Mm -hmm. Like when you hear something negative, it sticks with you for a longer time. So if we think positively about something, we need to talk about it as often as we can, including yeah. supporting women in STEM and telling girls that they can have a STEM career and they should. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I absolutely enjoyed our conversation. It's, I am feeling very excited and uh, not for not just for me that I had a good 45 minutes of conversation, but I'm just feeling excited about the world. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad. <laughs> you're, you're ready to, to eat some ice cream, pursue the rest of your day with positivity. Let's, let's end with that. So I recently found this, uh, I don't even know the brand name, but it's a, uh, it comes in a jar and you get it in your uh, uh, grocery store mm -hmm. and it's like layers of gelato and it's Whoa. really good. And oh they have gosh. layers like tiramisu ice cream and which actually has tiramisu layers in the form uh -huh. of ice cream and is extremely creamy and it's wonderful. I okay, can I'm going to go on a quest. <laughs> It comes in a jar. That's my okay. that's my identity of it. It comes in a jar. So okay. you don't have to finish it in one go. 
Oh, great. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, I thought you said you have to finish it in one go, and I was like, challenge accepted. <laughs> no, I am currently working on you don't have to finish the ice cream. You can keep it. It lasts mm -hmm. in the freezer. So you don't That's have to true. finish it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, oh, Zach wants to hear about your new book. Oh. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I wrote a book for MIT Press that's targeted at general audiences. So it's anybody sort of high school and, and above um, level understanding of science. Um, and I try to explain everything. Um, talking about how engineers are learning to build with biology, build with living cells, and use it to address problems in medicine, agriculture, uh, robotics and a lot of other disciplines. And I also talk about sort of the ethics and economic impacts of this kind of technology. So I hope it's interesting. <laughs> Um, it was a, definitely a labor of love and it was very intentional to write it for a general audience um, because I thought it was really important to share this exciting new aspect of science with um, a broad community. So thank you, Zach, for asking about that. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I uh, I, I missed that. I did not know that it, the book was for everyone. I don't know mm -hmm. how I missed it, but I'm going to read that book. I'm going oh, to read that you. book. And, uh, <laughs> Obviously, I would recommend it to everyone because I think, uh, like many other fields, for example, finance, science also needs to be translated into layman terms so that mm -hmm. everyone understands it and everyone is able to contribute to it. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And you can tell me if it's parts of it are boring because it's also a learning experience for me. It's the first time for me writing a long format um, story for a general audience. So <laughs> feedback is appreciated. I absolutely will. And you will obviously get questions from me when, you know, when I don't understand something, I will make sure that I ask you questions. And you will know that, oh, she didn't get that. And then you will know that <laughs> I didn't get it. Many others didn't get it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyways, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you so much for having this conversation. And uh, I, I, I know that you are a busy woman and uh, and yet I want to have as many conversations as we can with you and always back to what we just discussed that, you know, if you have positive opinion about something and you want to encourage something, we should talk about it more often. So yeah. until next time and thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having me.